Good morning, Kensington. How are you guys doing this morning? All right, you guys are doing great. Good. Awesome. Hey, welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're always happy to have you. And this is our first gathering together in person of 2023. So happy new year. And in this first song, this first song we're going to sing together acknowledges that we have all made mistakes. We've all had failures, but we are not defined by those mistakes and those failures. We are defined by what God says about us, what he thinks about us. So we're going to celebrate that right now. So if you're able to, would you stand with me and let's sing this song together. this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. Fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does.
what amazing truth is that? Where else do you hear that? To lay your burdens down and to check the shame at, your shame at the door. So that is amazing truth to start the day. And good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. There's a, there's a lot of laughter today. Um, good morning. My name is Mervat, and I'm on staff here at the Troy campus. It's so good to have our community back in the building. Uh, hope you all had a wonderful Christmas and a new year, and we're uh, the, start, the year is just starting out. So we have a lot of great things happening in January and wanted just to share a few of them with you. Actually, three specific things I wanted to share, and as I share them, I just want you to take a pause and pray that one of these opportunities is for you. At least one is for you. And our challenge to you today is that when you hear them and you hear that this is for me, bring somebody with you. That's the challenge. Don't come alone. Because this year we're going to move forward together. Our first one is our midweek chapels are back next week on Wednesday, the 11th. We will be meeting right in the lobby at 6, six o'clock for dinner. So bring the family, your friends, your group, um, your neighbor, and we'll have dinner together, build community, grow together. And then at 6.30, we'll be in the chapel to grow in our relationship with Christ together. So don't forget, it's this Wednesday. Um, and you don't have to worry about making dinner. You just show up. Uh, the second one is for men in the room. So men in the room, listen up. This is for you. And remember, don't come alone. So this Saturday, the 14th at 7.30 in the morning, we have a men's breakfast. Yes, yeah, something just for you. The amazing Joe Leal, our student ministry director and our, the grill master, who he's known as, um, will be grilling up some uh, breakfast tacos for you. And Steve Andrews will be speaking. So win-win, both ways. There'd be a great opportunity to be with other men, Steve Andrews, tacos. It's going to be a great day. So you can sign up um, real easy. It's five bucks, not a, not a big deal, but bring somebody with you so we know who's coming. Um, and that's the Saturday. Last uh, but not least, an opportunity to impact the world. And I, I say that literally. So uh, Hope Water Project Gala, it's our second annual gala. And if you're not familiar with the Hope Water Project, we're building wells in areas of the world where they don't have access to fresh water. No water means no anything, right? No health, no schools, no uh, church, nothing. So these wells allow all these things to happen and people to focus on other things. So we've built 135 wells in 14 years. Last year alone was five wells. So this year, our goal is to build five more wells in January 27th. So if you're interested, this is a great event. You get dressed up, you have a plate of dinner, there's an auction, there's a speaker, um, there's live entertainment, and it's going to be a great night to impact, tangibly impact the world. So that's on the 27th. You can go and get tickets. We already got ours, and we're looking forward to it. So in just a minute, Andrew's going to come up, and we're going to start our new series. But in the meantime, this is a great opportunity to stand up. Meet somebody around you and ask them how long they've been here, whether it's been one day or years. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. How are you guys all doing? Good? Fantastic. Yeah, there's a lot of energy over here. And hey, if we haven't met, my name is Andrew Kim, one of the people on staff here. I want to welcome all of you, not only here in the room, but wherever you are joining us via stream. And of course, it is a new year. So let me start off by asking this question. How many of you made New Year's resolutions this year? Just quick show of hands. You don't have to be afraid. You know, I just put up that hand. That's okay. Probably more than half of us, right? And I see a lot of hands. But let me ask you, eight days into 2023, has anyone just given up on their resolution already? Anyone? Yes. Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate it. It is not easy to keep those resolutions. But let me ask you another question on the other end of the spectrum, and this is a really difficult one. Has anyone in this room, I'm talking about in your life, has anyone ever kept a New Year's resolution. Anyone? Wow, a lot of people, a lot of people in this room. And let me tell you, it is an honor to be in your presence. 
because statistics tell us that 91% of people fail and fail to keep their resolutions, which means that you are in the top 9%. And I have never been in the top 9% in anything in my life. So congratulations <laughs> to you all. It is a really a privilege for us to breathe the same air as you do. But when it comes to a new year, the reason why so many of us, we make resolutions is because the new year offers us a blank slate. It provides us with an opportunity to bring about a change in an area of our life. So hopefully we're able to experience more joy, happiness, peace, and satisfaction. But if we truly want to experience sustained and lasting change, I believe that we can't just simply focus our attention on the things that are happening out here, but it actually has to start in here. And maybe for some of us, when we look inside, we may not like what we see. And maybe we believe that Jesus doesn't either, which may hinder us and prevent us from moving towards him and leaning into him in a greater way. But Jesus's invitation to us isn't to get our act together, to figure everything out and then come to him. But rather he tells us and he invites us, come as you are. Because when we do, we'll experience a transformation. He'll produce a transformation in our life that we never ever believed was possible. And he'll do this by taking us on the greatest adventure of our life. And so the question that he asks us, and we're gonna hear this in a song in a moment, is are you ready? Are we ready? And if we choose to answer yes to this question, I believe that 2023, this coming year, has the potential to be one of the greatest years of our life. Now, as you are, as you want to be, are you ready? Are you ready? Come now, tired, broken, scared, and just in need. Ready or not, it's all right. Take your time if nothing else, just come. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come now, bring your hopes and dreams and doubts and scars. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come now, bring your hearts and fears, your faith, your heart.
beautiful song and it's such a powerful reminder of what Jesus has already done in our life and that he's given us freedom he's given us hope he's conquered death and he's given us new life and honestly if that was it and if it ended right there that would be more than enough it'd be more than anyone else has ever done for you or for me but what he says is is not just in this song but in the scriptures are is that I want to do more in your life I'm not done with you yet I have more beauty that I want to infuse in your life, more life that I actually want to give you. And I believe that in 2023, that he wants to continue to do this work in your life and in mine. And everything that we desire to happen this year in our lives and the lives of the people around us, I truly believe begins with Jesus, which is why the greatest resolution that we could ever make is to lean into him, is to move towards him this year. Because when we take a step towards him and this movement happens, I truly believe that we will experience a transformation in our lives that's rooted in a revelation. And this is what I mean by that. Because when we come to know Jesus better, a natural byproduct of that is that we come to understand who we are better in him, our identity and who we've been created to be. And this has the power to free us from all the lies and all the baggage that we have been carrying around for so long so that we can step into in a greater way the life that he has created, destined, and designed for us to live. And this is what we're gonna be talking about today. So as we continue on, would you join me in prayer? Lord, we are grateful for who you are. We, grateful, we are grateful that you love us, that you have done all of these things, Lord, that we just heard about in this song. And you desire to do so much more because you are not done with any of us. And so we thank you, God, that you desire to do even more and even greater things in our lives. And thank you, Lord, that you persevere, that you endure, that you always keep coming. And so, Lord, to this question of are we ready or not, I pray, Lord, for us as a community that our answer would be a collective yes so that we could see more of who you are, Lord, and the beauty of who you are infused not only in our lives but in the world around us as well. And so we thank you and we pray all of these things in your powerful, powerful name. Amen. Amen. And so a couple of years ago, my wife, Robin, she told me about a story about the very first time she ever traveled outside the country. And it was when she was 15 years old and she hopped on a plane to go to El Salvador on a short-term trip. And so she had no idea what to expect. First time on a plane, first, out, first time outside the United States, first time to Central America. And so she wanted to be prepared. And so she tried to bring everything that she possibly could. We're talking shoes for every occasion, clothes for every type of weather, you name it, she tried to bring it. And her suitcase ended up being so full that she had to sit on it to get it closed, right? We probably, many of us have experienced that. But she got it in, she checked it in, and for her and her team, in order to get to El Salvador, they had to have a layover in Miami. And so what this meant was, was that they also had to clear customs there. So they picked up their baggage, they went through customs, and then they had to check it in on the other side. But the problem was, was that their gate, where this flight was leaving from, was clear cut on the other side of the airport. So they all had to haul all of their stuff across this massive building. But for Robin, she had packed so much stuff and her suitcase was so heavy that the wheels on it broke. So she had to drag her suitcase across Miami International. But it gets worse because for some inexplicable reason, the baggage handlers also left her bag on the tarmac in the pouring rain. And because her suitcase was so cheap, the dye from the suitcase material bled into all of her stuff. So she gets to El Salvador and she ends up having to throw most of her stuff away. But this is the realization that she had after she had thrown out most of her stuff. She realized that she was fine and that she didn't need it. And so much of what she had and so much of what she brought was just simply extra baggage that she did not need and was weighing her down. And I believe that for every single one of us, whether we're here in this room or whether you're watching via stream, 
all of us, we all carry around and have carried around extra baggage in our life that has been weighing us down and that we simply do not need. It may be a lie that was spoken over us years, maybe even decades ago that we've been holding on to. Maybe it's a past mistake that we've allowed to define us year after year after year. Maybe it's guilt or shame. Maybe it's remorse over a mistake that we made in our past. And so today, what we're going to be doing is we're starting a brand new series called ID Renewal, where over the next several weeks, we're going to be having a conversation about who we are in Christ, our identity, who God has created us to be. And in taking this journey, we're going to be looking at parts of this book in the New Testament called Ephesians. But another resource that I want to let you all know about that I would love for you to opt into and to jump into is a great digital devotional that we have, we have not created it. Actually, Corey Hendrickson, our discipleship director, he created it, and he has done an incredible job. And to opt into this, all we have to do is text the word identity to that number, 248-781-2757. So I'd love for you, whether you're here in this room or you're joining us via stream, take out your phone and text the word identity to that number. I did it earlier this week. And really the purpose of this is for us to continue the conversation, what we start on Sundays, that we would continue to learn and go deeper during the week. And I promise you, we will not blow up your phone. You will not be getting a text message from us every hour. It'll just be one text message. And on certain days, it'll be a devotional for us to read and reflect on. Other times it'll be a blog article. Other times it may be a song. But whatever it is, it really is for us to really think about and be reminded of of. This is who we are. This is who we have been created to be. And so if you would like to be a part of that, text the word identity to that number. And so as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at parts of this book in the New Testament called the book of Ephesians. And Ephesians was originally a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to a community of Jesus followers in the Greek city of Ephesus way back in the first century AD. And when you hear the word Ephesus, when you think about that city, maybe some of us have been there. But I don't know what most of us, but if you haven't, I don't know what you think of when you hear the name of that city. And maybe for some of us, we might think it's this tiny little city in the middle of nowhere. But back in Paul's day in the first century, that was not what Ephesus was. Because Ephesus at the time was the fourth largest city in the ancient world. And it was located right on the Aegean Sea. And it had one of the greatest seaports in the world at the time. So it was the LA, it was the Tokyo, it was the Hong Kong of its day. And the church in Ephesus had been started by the Apostle Paul, and he spent three years there teaching the people in this church community about who God is, about as to who they were in him and how they were to live. And so it was teaching upon teaching. But as we have all experienced, as human beings, we have a tendency to forget. And so Paul, understanding this, he wrote this letter that we have in our Bibles a handful of years later to remind them of what he had taught them, the truths and the realities of, what, of who they were. And in the first portion of the letter, his message to them was very, very simple. And he says the same thing basically over and over and over again. And he tells these people, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. And so today in looking at this, we're just gonna be looking at one sentence. But this is the thing. It is the greatest run-on sentence, I feel like, in the history of the world. And if Paul wrote this in his language arts class, I, felt, I feel like he would have failed, right? Because who writes a run-on sentence this long? And he wrote this letter originally in the Greek language, and it is more than 200 words long in the Greek. It is a long sentence. And so we're going to be looking at parts of this today. But in this sentence, he provides us with two powerful images as to who we are in Christ. And so this is what he has to say at the very beginning, the first portion of the sentence. He writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. And there's so much that we can unpack here. But what we want to focus on today is that Paul tells us that what God did was that he chose us, that he adopted us to be a part of his family. And he didn't do this out of, ob- out of obligation. He didn't do this because somebody forced him to do this. 
but he did it because he wanted to, understanding that it would provide him, it would give him an incredible amount of joy and happiness. And for some of us, we understand very, very well what adoption, the power, what the power of adoption is and everything that adoption entails. Maybe because we've been adopted ourselves or maybe we've adopted a child into our family. But probably for many of us, and this includes me, it's difficult for us to fully comprehend everything that it involves. But for the people who Paul was writing to in the Greek city of Ephesus way back in the first century AD, they understood adoption quite well because they came from an abandonment culture where babies were regularly discarded for a variety of reasons. And many of these children, they would be simply left outside in places like the marketplace or the garbage dump. And so that they would be exposed to the elements. And the prevailing belief was, was that if the gods wanted to spare the lives of these children, they would come and save them. And what would happen to these children many times is that for some of them, for the lucky ones, that they would be picked up by people. And some of the people who would pick these babies up would take them home into their houses and raise them to be their slaves. Other children would be picked up by couples who were unable to have biological children of their own. And still others, in fact, many others, were picked up by Jesus followers who raised these children as their very own to be a part of their family. And so these were the people who Paul was writing to, people who understood this very well. And for some of them, they didn't understand it just because they saw it and because it was happening around them, but they understood it because firsthand, this is what had happened to them. They were the ones who had been thrown out and they were the ones who had been taken in. So they understood very well what it meant to be chosen, what it meant to be adopted. And so Paul's message to them and his message to us today is that if we have been adopted into the family of Christ, what matters the most, what is the most important is not who threw you out, but who took you in. What matters the most is not who didn't want you, but who wants you now, whose family you're a part of now. And so he says, remember this, remember who you are. And years ago, I heard the story of a family who adopted a daughter. And this child had previously been adopted by another family, but for various reasons, this previous family had decided to dissolve the adoption, which allowed this other family to enter in and welcome this child into their home. And for some reason, the previous family, whenever they had gone to Disney World, had taken all of their biological children, but never their adopted daughter. And so she came to believe it was because of something that she had done that she was excluded every single time. And so when her family learned about this, they immediately scheduled a trip to Disney World. But about a month before they were scheduled to leave, her behavior started spiraling downward. And she started stealing things, lying about things, saying awful and hurtful things to the people around her. And so a couple of days before their family was supposed to leave for Disney World, her dad pulled her aside. But before he was able to say anything, she blurted out, I know what you're going to say. I know what you're going to say. You're not taking me to Disney World, are you? And in that moment, he realized what she had been doing. Because she knew and she had learned that she couldn't earn her way to Disney World because she had already tried that and failed. And so she was living in a way to try to distance herself as far as possible from it to try to minimize her disappointment. And in that moment, her dad was tempted to say, yes, that's exactly what's going to happen. You're not going to Disney World unless you change your behavior, unless you start making better decisions. But luckily for him, he didn't. Instead, he asked her two questions. And he first asked her, is this a trip that we're taking together as a family? And she slowly nodded. And then he asked her, are you a part of this family? And then she nodded again. And a couple days later, they went together to Disney World. And after their first day there, she was absolutely exhausted. And as she was falling asleep, her dad asked her, how was your day? And she opened her eyes ever so slightly. And with a smile on her face, she said to him, I finally got to go to Disney World. But it wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. And this is the thing. That is not just who she is. That is who every single one of us are as well. It's the core of our identity in that we are children of God. And what that means is, is that we have not been abandoned. 
is that we are adopted. We are not forsaken, but we are chosen. That that is our name. The world calls us a lot of different things. But at the same time, when God looks at you and me, he says, you are my son. You are my daughter. I have adopted you. I have chosen you. Nobody forced me to do, it, do this, but I have done that. And that is who we are. And when we actually choose to believe this, it changes everything in our life. And as a community, when I think about our community, that we have been given this extraordinary message of hope and love and life and joy and peace. And our desire is to communicate it to the world. And that's why when I look at the, the work that God has been able to do through this community, it truly is extraordinary, not just here in the local area, but truly all around the world. Whether it's be sports camps in the Dominican Republic, our work in Afghanistan, Israel, Brazil, India, the list goes on and on and on. And let me say that this would not be able to happen without your generosity and without your partnership. And so we are so incredibly grateful. And so what we wanted to do right now as we continue in our service, we also wanted to take a moment to receive our offering. So ushers, I want to invite you to come down for that. And something that is, is that if you would like to financially partner with us, there are a number of ways that we can do so. And of course, the offering bags are going to be coming around in a moment. But as you see on the side screens, we can also give many ways electronically. We can scan the QR code that's up on the screen. We can also text the word Kensington to 77977. We can give via the app or the website as well. But if you are somebody who does financially partner with us, maybe for some of us, we have had a, this partnership for months, maybe years. Maybe this is the first time that some of us are going to give. We just simply want to say thank you. Thank you for your open-handedness and thank you that allows us as a community to really move towards the mission, accomplishing the mission that God has for us. But going back to this incredibly long run-on sentence that Paul writes. This is what he says in the next portion of it, and it's powerful. And that he says, in him, meaning in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under Christ. And in verse 7, what Paul says is that we have redemption through his blood, Christ's blood, Christ's sacrifice. We have been redeemed and ultimately that this is who we are, that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And the term redemption expresses this idea of buying back or the setting free of something or someone so that it can return to its original owner. And it actually has its roots in the Old Testament where there were laws in place so that lands and people could be returned to the original owner. People and lands that had been exchanged had gone from the original owner to then the next. And it could find a way to make that return back. And one of the passages that we actually find this idea in is in the book of Leviticus, and it talks about land. And this is what it says. If one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem, buy back, set it free. That's what it's talking about, what they have sold. If, however, there is no one to redeem it for them, but later on they prosper and acquire sufficient means to redeem it themselves, they are to determine the value for the years since they sold it and refund the balance to the one whom they sold it. They can then go back to their own property. This is the idea. This is the idea of redemption. And it's not just about things or land. It's not, and it also includes people. It's the buying back. It's the setting free. And another example is the people of God. Because the people of God in the scriptures are known as a redeemed people. Because they were slaves in Egypt for more than four centuries. But God, because he loved them so deeply, he sent a man named Moses to liberate them, to set them free. And for the people who Paul was writing to in the first century, they understood this concept of redemption quite well. Because from about 100 BC to about 100 AD, for about that 200 year period, the city of Ephesus was the world capital of the slave trade. And so in this city, just as you could buy and sell shoes and clothing and food, you could also buy and sell people. And for some of the people who were in this church community, they didn't just know about this. They didn't just hear about this or see it happening. They understood it firsthand because they were slaves. Because later on in the book of Ephesians, Paul addresses them and he says to the slaves in this community, obey your masters, do this. 
And so there were people who Paul was writing to who understood firsthand, this is what it means. I know what it feels like to be bought and sold and to be the property of another. But this is what Paul is saying to them. Even though this, is, this may be what you do, this is not ultimately who you are. That first and foremost, at the core of your being, you do not belong to that other person. You do not belong to your slave master, but you belong to me. And at the very core of your being, I have set you free from the greatest thing possible, something that nobody else can do. I have set you free from sin and death, guilt and shame, and you have been redeemed. And sure, the world may say that this is who you are, that you are a slave, but trust me, you are so much more than that, that I have bought you back. I have set you free. Your name is redeemed. Your name is liberated. And so he says that in the context of where you are, that I want you to live like this as a redeemed and as a liberated person. And a couple of years ago, I completed a step study. And the material is the exact same material that we use as a part of our Celebrate Recovery or CR program right here at Kensington. And sometimes a stereotype with step studies and sometimes a stereotype with Celebrate Recovery is that it's only for people who are struggling with drugs and alcohol. And yes, it is for people who are struggling with drugs and alcohol, but really it's for anyone who wants to take a step towards freedom in any area of their life. It could be, it could be anger, it could be codependency, it could be pornography, whatever it may be. And I am the firm of the firm belief that every single person could take a step study and benefit from it in some way. And for me, my guide on the journey was a man named Bill. And Bill, he's incredible. He was an incredible man and he actually passed away last year. But I remember the very first time that we got together, he told me a portion of his story. And he told me that for 45 years, he was an alcoholic. And then one morning, he woke up in a dumpster again. And he looked around at his circumstance and he said, I don't wanna live like this anymore. And so he checked himself into rehab. And even though he believed that God wouldn't hear any of his prayers because of all the chaos and all the turmoil and all the brokenness that he had created in his life and the lives of the people around him, he still decided to give it a shot. So every day, every morning, he would get up and he would get down on his knees and he would ask God, would you please keep me from the compulsion and the compassion and the consumption of alcohol today? And then at night, he would get down his, on his knees again and he would just simply say to God, thank you, thank you. And there was a tunnel that connected the house that he was staying in to the house next door. And every single day, multiple times a day, Bill would go up and down this tunnel. And on day 42 of his rehab, he hit his head on the overhead pipes three times, something that had never happened to him before. And he was wondering what was going on. Because as I mentioned, he had never experienced that. He didn't even know there were pipes there. But yet he hit his head on it three times. Never happened before. And in that moment, he realized that it was because he was no longer looking down. But now he was looking up. And he also realized in that moment that God was doing a work that only he could do in his life. That God was healing him. That he was setting him free from the guilt from the shame, from all the brokenness that had built up and that had been accumulating for more than four decades of his life, that God was doing that in his life. That because who he was is that he's, God was saying to him, hey, this is not who you are and I can set you free and I have set you free. And this is also who you and I are as well because our name, our name is not slave, but rather it's free. Our name is not condemned, but rather it is redeemed. And that is who you, who you and I are. And Paul says over and over again to us in the first handful of chapters in this letter, he says, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. You are chosen, you are adopted, that you are a child of God, that you have been liberated and that you have been set free. And for every single one of us, we've probably been to a gathering or a get together, some type of get together where everyone didn't know each other's names. And so probably on a name tag like this, we were asked to put down our names. So it's not so awkward when you meet somebody for the second time and you're like, what's your name again? And it's right there. And the reason why we write down our names is because our names are one of the primary ways that we identify ourselves and also differentiate ourselves from other people. But when we actually think about it, our names don't communicate much about who we are. Because when I tell you, my name is Andrew, 
It doesn't tell you anything about my family or my interests or my passions, the joys and the victories that I've experienced in my life or even the mistakes and the failures I've made in my life. It doesn't really tell you any of that. So what if, what if, rather than writing down our names, and I'm not saying that we go around doing this, but rather than writing down our names, our given names, we actually wrote down the name of who we truly believe we are. And if we were to actually do that, what would you write on this name tag? What would it be? And for me, growing up, I believed so many lies about who I was. And I still struggle with many of these lies to this day. And so years ago, when I was growing up, if you were to ask me, what would you write down? If I was really, really honest, I would have said, my name is ugly because I believe this for so much of my life. I was overweight as a kid. I went through this terrible time in high school and college where I had awful acne, which is terrible as a kid that age. It was so bad that I was so embarrassed and ashamed that I wouldn't even look at myself in the mirror, had trouble even looking, looking at people's, people in the eyes because I just didn't want them to see my face. This is who I believed I was. But at the same time, it didn't end there. Because if you were to ask me, who are you during that period of my life? I would have also said that my name is worthless. Because in high school, I was bullied for a number of years, didn't have a single friend. And I thought to myself, why is this happening to me? Truly, if I have value in my life, that somebody would be with me in this. But there was no one, and it was just me, or at least that's how I felt. And I was thinking to myself, clearly, it's because I don't, I'm not worth anything. So that's why I don't have friends. That's why I'm going through this. And all of us should have received one of these name tags when we walked in in a pen. And this is what I want us to think about right now. Because every single one of us have these things. What is the lie or the lies that have been floating around in your head? The lies that tell you that this is who you are, that you have come to believe. What is the name or the names that you have been called or maybe you have called yourself that over the years you have come to believe that this is who I am? And let me say, it doesn't matter. For some of us, you guys are a good looking crowd. And this is the thing, that it doesn't matter what we look, out, look like out here. It doesn't matter the car we drive or how much money we make, the title at work that we have, how happy we look on the outside. I can guarantee something I know about every single one of us here and every single person who's watching on stream, including myself, is that we have these names. We have these lies that are floating around in our head that we've carried around for far too long. And so this is what I'm gonna ask you to do just right now, is that I wanted to, to take the next 10 seconds and to do something very courageous on these name tags that we received. What is the name that you have called yourself for so long? What is the lie that you have thought to yourself for so long. You don't have to show anyone. You don't have to put it on your chest. But I want to invite you to do something courageous and just write it down. Just write it down on that name tag. Just let's take the next 10 seconds and write one or two of those names down. And back in college, one of the courses that I took was a neurobiology class. Loved the class, learned a lot. And one of the things that I learned in that class is that as human beings, when we learn a new piece of information, for example, when we learn for the very first time that two plus two equals four, there is a new neural pathway that is created. Something physical happens in our brain and a new neural pathway is created in our brain. And as we come to learn this information better and better and better, what happens to that pathway is that it becomes stronger and it becomes more solidified. And as we continue to learn it and, and when we master it, it becomes a default thought. It's just automatic and it just comes to us. So we can be walking down the road and someone might jump out from behind a tree and yell at us, what's two plus two? And our new knee-jerk knee reaction will naturally be it's four because that pathway is so strong. 
But at the same time, that's the case with other information as well. Because when we hear for the first time, when we believe for the first time that what our name is, is ugly, it's worthless, it's mistake, it's unloved, what happens is, is that a new neural pathway is created in our brain. And as we hear this more, and as we say this to ourselves more, as we believe it more, that pathway becomes stronger and stronger and stronger until it becomes a default thought. And we think, who are we? That we are ugly, that we are worthless, that this is who we are. But if we actually want to counteract that, if we want to live and move and believe in a different way, it requires every one of us to create a different pathway. And for to strengthen that, to invest into that pathway, which is why it's so important for us to remind ourselves of truth, which is why it's so important for us to daily and regularly read the scriptures because the scriptures tell us, God tells us through the Bible that this is who you are, that this is your identity. It's also the reason why things like the men's breakfast earlier, why it's so important for us to be in community with other people and not, and not just any people, but people who speak words of life, not words of death to us. Because when that happens, what ends up happening is that this new pathway that pathway gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And this other pathway that's filled with lies begins to atrophy. And that's ultimately that something beautiful happens. But we have to make that decision to move in that direction consistently and regularly and every single day. And that's what you and I have to do. And it is not an easy thing. And so one of the things that we want to do today is we we want to take a step in this direction. And in a moment, what we're going to see on the side screens are going to be statements that come up, that communicate this is who we are in addition to what we've been talking about today, in addition to the fact that we are chosen, that we are adopted, that we are redeemed, that we are liberated people, that there are other statements all from the scriptures. And my hope is, is that for some of us, that today as we read those, that a new pathway would be created in our brains. And for others of us, a pathway that already exists would be strengthened, would be more solidified. And that today this beautiful exchange would occur, that we would continue to exchange the lies that we have believed for the truth of God. But before we do that, would you join me in prayer? God, thank you. I'm grateful for this community, Lord. And we all, every single one of us, we carry around extra baggage, Lord, things that weigh us down that we don't need, things that are not of you, God. And you want us to be free, Lord. And you've created a way for us to be exactly that through your son's death on the cross. And so, Lord, it's a difficult road, God, because we've received these messages and we continue to receive these messages every single day about who we are not, but yet we believe them, I believe them, so many of us believe them, God. But Lord, I pray, Lord, help us to really be able to remind ourselves every day of the truth of who you say we are, God, and that that pathway would be so much stronger than the lies and the other names that we may hear, Lord, and that the world communicates to us. And so, Lord, we pray that your voice would be the loudest voice in our heads and in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that you have created us for a beautiful purpose. Thank you, Jesus. And we pray all these things in your powerful, powerful name. Amen. Amen.
But as we can see, and as we've heard, there's so much space in scripture that's dedicated to reminding us who we are. In the New Testament, we often find it like this. The writers will say, this is who you were, and then Christ enters in, and now this is who you are. For example, we were once far away, but now because of Jesus, we've been brought near. Or we were once dead, and now because of Jesus, we've been made alive. Some friends of mine a few years ago, Dwight and Melinda and I were singing around, sitting around talking about these things, about who we were before Christ, how Jesus found us and who we are now. And we thought to ourselves, let's write a song about it. So this is a song that just says, we've got, we had some old names, but now we have a new name. Perhaps you'll identify with some of these. Hopeless, abandoned, forgotten, and so far away. Those were my names. Unworthy, addicted, unholy, afflicted in shame. Those were my names Unto you spoke over me Your truth reminding me That I have a new name Child of the King your mercy I've been redeemed by love and I hear you calling I choose to believe what you speak over me is who to 
something that I forgot to do uh, in this service that I did in the first service is that it's not only important for us to recognize the lies that we believed, but to also replace it with truth and to be reminded of who God says we are. And so on the name tags, even right now, or even when you have these name tags, I feel like it's so important for us to cross out the lie and to say, hey, no, this is my real name. This is what God actually calls me. And so even if you have this and you're looking at this, that we in our minds would cross out that lie and replace it with the truth of who God says we are. And that this week, that every single day, my challenge to all of us is be reminded of these truths about who we are, that we would not only know this, but also live this out. And so we're so incredibly grateful for you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for streaming as well. And have a great rest of your weekend, everyone.